Welcome to today's webinar, What You Haven't Heard About LED Upgrades But Should. I'm Ann Cosgrove, the editor of Facility Executive Magazine, and this webinar is presented by GE Lighting in partnership with Graybar. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. Please note the control box panel on your screen. This is where you can submit questions via that question box in the panel. You can send in your questions at any time, and our speaker will address them after the presentation. Also, please note the orange arrow on the left side of your control panel. Clicking on that arrow will either expand or collapse the panel, so please be sure the panel is expanded so you can access that question box. Also, if at any time you experience a technical difficulty, please send a message to us in that question section. Okay, so let's get started and meet your speaker today. Shelley Sedlak is a Senior Lighting Specialist at the GE Neela Park Lighting Institute. Shelley has more than 25 years of experience in the industry, and she's been with GE since early 2000. Prior to GE, she has worked in other sales and technical cap capacities in the industry. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of Southern California and an MBA from Ohio University. She is also a member of IES, a senior member of IEEE, holds a lighting certified credential from the National Council on Qualifications for the Lighting Professions, and she is a USGBC Lead AP. Shelley has served on the IES and NCQLP boards as a director, and she's active on several industry committees. Before Shelley begins her presentation, Dave Miller, National Market Manager for Graybar, has a few words. Dave? Hi. On behalf of Graybar, thank you for joining our facility executive webinar, What You Haven't Heard About LED Upgrades But Should. So to kind of tee this up, we're all very aware of the opportunities for lighting renovation and LED in our business. Now that technology, quality, and price are coming together to make an attractive scenario for you, we're also seeing a dizzying array of products screaming for your attention. If you simply Google LED lamp, you'll get over 11 million hits, of course, in only 0.48 seconds. So how in the world do you make an intelligent decision about lighting for the next 10 to 20 years in your facility with the amount of options you have? At Graybar Electric, we've been in the lighting business since the beginning. Whether it is with webinars like this today with Facility Executive or our Graybar PowerSmart energy teams across the U.S., Graybar is here to help provide solutions that get you the ROI you need with the great lighting results you need and with brands you trust. So to help bring clarity to those real issues that you're facing in choosing an LED upgrade solution, we've teamed with the experts at GE's Neela Park Institute. Shelley is an instructor at the Neela Park Institute and will be presenting a session with topics covering lighting. It's for people. Everything from how light is delivered to how light is used by the human eye. It's at the basic of all of this. Looking beyond color rendering index. And what do you need to know in terms of life cycle costing? So thanks again for joining. If you want to learn more, please visit www.graybar.com power smart or www.gelighting.com. So here is Shelley. Well, thanks for, uh, for a nice intro, Anna, Dave, um, and I want to give everybody out there listening today a thank you for joining us. Uh, I know you're probably quite busy, so what we're going to do is we'll walk together here for the next 45 minutes to an hour about some key things about LED upgrades, right? So first uh, first off, what I want to do is talk a little bit about your lighting toolbox right now. And if you think about it, if all you have is a hammer sitting in your toolbox, regardless of what problem you have, you're going to use the hammer. And our hammer has been traditional lighting sources that have been around for 130 plus years from the invention of that incandescent lamp in the late 1800s to the invention of fluorescent which was invented in the late 1930s, um, to our metal halides and high-pressure sodiums that were invented in the late 1960s. Now, here's an interesting fact you may not know, is that the LED, um, the, the first one was red, and it was actually invented in the early 60s. But come about 2005, 2008 timeframe, white, viable LED lighting was starting to show up um, as a solution, so our toolbox got a lot bigger. And so now when we think about it, um, I like this slide because, you know, the problems that we have in operating and maintaining our buildings and providing productive and safe environments for the, the occupants within them, 
um, we now have more than just a hammer to be able to provide some solutions. So uh, as Dave mentioned earlier, we're going to focus on four key areas. Obviously, there are a lot more um, segments that we could go into when it comes to LED upgrades, but I felt that these are probably the four that are of the most importance right now, whether it's uh, because of new changes, new advancements, or honestly top of the mind, right? So what we're going to talk about is lighting quality. We're going to talk about color quality. There's a difference. We're going to talk about how do you deliver light into your spaces. And of course, we will put the, the ribbon around this uh, package here, and that's the economic discussion. So let's go ahead and get started with the first section about lighting quality. And uh, again, as Ann mentioned, I was um, on the board of directors for the IES. I'm still very involved with that organization, the Illuminating Engineering Society. They have a lot of great documents and books that you can pick up at their bookstore. And I, I zoomed in on this one. This is a design guide, DG18. And I picked up this quote, and I thought it really summarizes what it is that we need to think about when we are working with lighting in our spaces that, you know, being able to have this connection to our environment around us is very important and that how we light our spaces has a significant impact both psychologically and, and physiologically. I'm going to touch on a couple of those. So bottom line is think about why we have electric light to begin with. It's for people. It's for people to be productive for them to be safe and secure, to be comfortable. And so whatever we do, whatever impact we um, start to go forward with on our lighting upgrades, just remember that you will have an impact on the people that have to live and, and breathe under those spaces. So what are we doing here? Well, in these three circles, um, what we're trying to do is balance out three main aspects, human needs, architecture, and our economics and environment and balance these so that we have good quality lighting. And if we think about this, you know, human needs, again, it's always been about the people. Um, there's a lot of things going on there. Their atmosphere um, is, is significant and people being healthy and being able to, if you're, if you're a retailer, provide lighting that um, gives authenticity to your products. Architecture, right? We, we spend a lot of money to make our buildings look wonderful and be functional and we have uh, codes and standards that we're adhering to to make sure everything's tied together. The green circle is where we seem to have been stuck, though, for the last few decades. It's all been about the numbers. You know, how many KWH are we paying the utility? Are we going to save? How many watts is that system? Um, are we focusing just on the numbers? And we have been, and we, we've started to forget about the people. What I, what I want to do here for the next few minutes now is take uh, one or two aspects out of each of these circles. So of course, I want to start with the people. Um, there is a very long laundry list of how lighting impacts folks. And a couple that really are starting to gain a lot of traction and a lot of interest because of the flexibility of LED lighting is one, lighting for the aging eye. Our society is getting older and the eye as we age, need, has different needs. It has different needs for light levels and colors and things like that. And also circadian timing or circadian rhythm. And what the heck is that? So circadian rhythm is basically your biological clock. When it's dark outside, your body says, hey, I, I think I need to go to bed. And when the sun comes up, your body wakes up and says, come on, let's go. We've got a lot of things to do here. And if you think about um, how our sun and moon uh, interacts here, We've thrown a little monkey wrench into that by putting electric lighting in until, say, 11, 12 o'clock at night or waking, having to wake up before the sun gets up. So there are some, some things there that have a significant impact. Um, light, as, uh, as the researchers have shown us, has three known routes. One is visual. Obviously, we can see things. That's instantaneous. Perceptual. Perceptual, a, a good example might be if you're um, on the railroad tracks and you're looking way down how the tracks seem to converge. Well, we know in our, our logic that those tracks are still parallel to each other, but our visual system is seeing them converge. So there's this adaptation that's taking place. Uh, another example might be your white ceramic coffee cup that you have on your kitchen sink in the morning and one side might be in the shadows, and, and so therefore it looks like that half of the cup is gray. But our brain knows that that is a white coffee cup. 
and then of course circadian rhythm and a good example of an application where lighting has an impact is for any um, application that's 24 7 for example healthcare so our staff and even the patients that are in these environments they go to work at night our third shift operation operations and they're in the light and they get off work and they're still in the light and so what happens is their circadian rhythm can be thrown off and circadian rhythm is actually tied to melatonin which is a um, hormone level so we have a physiological impact on people and the solid state lighting or LED is now flexible enough to let us adjust and make our lights perform in a way that has a better impact on people such as that. All right, jumping over to the blue circle about our architecture. Um, these four blocks here are really converging on lighting technology. Um, the first one there in the upper, um, upper left corner, lighting legislation and regulation. The government, um, and that's, this is predominantly federal, but there are some other state government um, policies in place, have really said, hey, w we need to focus on energy efficiency even more so than we've ever had to before. So lumen per watt, light output per energy consumption, that's LPW levels, um, are changing. Um, quality of light is now becoming a requirement, so it's more impactful than just how many watts are you going to save by switching from one technology to another. And then if we shift down a block, we see codes, right? So our energy codes uh, tell us basically what we need to do within our spaces, and what's happening here is the lighting power density, LPDs, are being reduced. So for example, an office space is now at 0.9 watts per square foot. And if you think about that, using an older technology, and, and there's still a lot of T12 fluorescent lamps out there, that is really difficult to do to meet those numbers. Even a T8 system, you're pretty tapped out unless you're adding some controls and doing some other things. Whereas when you look at an LED system, you could be anywhere 0.4 to 0.6 watts a square foot, which is a significant reduction in your energy consumption. And I'm talking a lot about this LED tsunami that we're all experiencing, but guess what? There's one another tsunami right behind it, and that's controls. Controls are now part of our energy codes and standards requirements. Um, that's another technology I would highly advise you to make sure that you understand and learn about um, some significant opportunities. We'll, we'll touch on this here in just a moment. Now, if you jump up to the block on the top right, standards and certifications aren't necessarily energy codes, um, such as LEED. The U.S. Green Building Council's LEED has been replaced by version 4 as of this summer. And I think one of the most interesting things that I found with the newest version of LEED is there is actually required lighting quality in the EQ part of the credit. So it's, it's not just about watts and how much energy you save, but it's making sure that occupants are in good, well-lit spaces. And then the bottom right corner there, net zero energy uh, buildings, uh, there's a lot of initiatives out there that are talking about meeting the ESA or Energy Independent Security Act 2025 goals, it's not that far away, of basically what a building consumes in energy, they must produce as well so that you have a zero, uh, net zero um, impact. And, and we're starting to see some of that percolating up, and guess what? LEDs are a perfect technology to be able to help to achieve those net zero energy goals. So all of these things are happening, um, and it's all around lighting. Now controls, I wanted to talk a little bit about controls as well, and then in the graph here that you see, if you look at this as a typical commercial building, industrial would be a smaller number, uh, but not by a whole lot. If you look at that, lighting is a sizable chunk of the energy that's being spent. Um, HVAC, of course, being another sizable chunk. And guess what? When you start to utilize lighting controls that are talking to building automation systems, you can actually, instead of having an individual end use, you can start to create systemic energy savings. So lighting and HVAC can actually be tied uh, pretty close together. And why is this important? Well, first of all, the energy codes and the standards are saying, you know, you need to control your spaces. And there's a lot of opportunity out there, so the demand is starting to increase. So again, this is another aspect. And why is, is uh, LED important for this? Well, think about metal halides, your parking lot fixtures, or the, the type of 
uh, fixtures that you might have in an industrial space, they're very difficult to dim. As a matter of fact, you can't dim them below 50%. It's just the nature of that old technology. Um, your parking lots use a lot of metal halide and high pressure sodium. Again, you can't dim below 50%, but with an LED, you can dim these significantly lower and have instant on capabilities. So as a technology, solid state lighting is much more flexible when it comes to controllability. Okay, now we're going to jump into the green circle where we've uh, been hanging out for the last few decades, as I mentioned earlier. And I wanted to start first with maintenance because I'm sure a lot of people on this phone are very concerned about maintenance and maintenance dollars. Uh, what I'd like to do is have you look at the left-hand side of your screen where it says traditional lamps, uh, B50 mortality. So let's talk a little bit about our hammer that we've had in our toolbox for quite some time. How do we rate life on traditional technologies such as fluorescent? And I'm going to use that as an example here. The way that this is done is it's statistical numbers. So if I were to take 100 fluorescent lamps and put them on a table, and fire them up. When half of them, when number 50 dies, I look up at the clock and I go, oh, okay, this is a family is going to get a 20,000 or a 36,000 hour or an 84,000 hour rating. That's why half of your lamps in your space will not make their life ratings, but the other half will continue to burn beyond. However, that other half are going to start to rapidly die off. And so you see the red line in this chart here there's a significant drop off in life. Bottom line, what this chart is telling you though, it is a failure mode. Now if you look at the chart on the right, this is LED. Instead of looking at failure mode, what we're looking at is lumen maintenance. Uh, for anybody on the phone that's not quite sure what lumens are, that is the light output of your light source. And let's face it, that's what it's about. You want to have as much of those lumens that you, you purchased in your light fixtures and your lamps so it's all about maintaining that. So what happens is um, for life ratings in LED, in this particular example, it says 50,000 hours. And what the chart is telling us is we still have light. We don't have failures. All of the fixtures are still on. But our lumens have dropped off. So there's a second number that you look for beyond hours. You look for the L number. And in this chart here, you'll see it says L70. And I'm going to move my cursor over here. So L70. Now there's no standard industry number right now, so this L70 could say L85, it could say L50. What that's telling you is if it's an L70, I still have 70% of my lumens at 50,000 hours. Or if this number said 100,000 hours, I would still have 70% of my lumens. Now just a little picture to kind of explain this is think about the tire. Failure mode means you have a flat tire, you have to do something about it. It could be the parking lot fixture uh, over the main entranceway and you want to make sure people are safe. You're going to have to take care of that fixture right away. Whereas on the right side, what's happening is the tread in our tires are going down to a point where we say, you know, it's time to make a change. It's time to get a new tire. That tread that's going down is basically your foot candle levels. Your lumen depreciation is occurring. You still have light but it is starting to diminish. So this is a, a, a real paradigm shift on how we look at life ratings and how we calculate maintenance. So what I want to do is walk you through a maintenance example. Let's pretend that this is our parking lot fixture. A lot of metal halide out there. The light blue line right here is going to be that lumen maintenance curve of your LED system at 50,000 hours. The sawtooth curve here is going to be your metal halide, which has a failure mode, that statistical B50 failure mode. So what's happening is your lamps are going to stop working, you're going to have to replace them, and then that next batch will stop working, you're going to have to keep doing this over and over. And so in a 50,000 hour period, typical burn hours for a parking lot would be about anywhere from 8 to 10 years, you're going to have to replace your metal halide lamps about five times before you have to start worrying about your LED fixtures. So the chart that's over here on the right side now starts to add up those numbers, your cumulative cost of having to continuously replace the lamps. And that is an important factor to look at when you're starting to do the economic talk. Another part that I wanted to point out is, let's pretend that you have a perfectly rectangular uh, shaped parking lot. 
what you would do to light that parking lot is you would probably have some of these shoebox style fixtures on the perimeter and then probably some shoebox fixtures in the middle of the parking lot so that you have coverage. And they'll be 400 watts. And by the way, because of the ballast, it's more like 460 watts. So regardless of whether it's perimeter or the center, you're going to have 460 watts on each shoebox fixture. Well, with LED, because now instead of dealing with one giant lamp, you have small point sources that you can aim in different directions. So now instead of using 460 watts in the perimeter, I can take my LED board and use about half the watts and get my center coverage. And then if I'm on the perimeter here and I'm trying to push the light forward, I can essentially cut my board in half and point my, point, my small point sources into the parking lot and I can cut that into half again. So this is an even bigger energy story than just going from a one-to-one. -one. You actually have different configurations that you can do. All right, next topic we're going to talk about is color quality. So I want to explain a little bit about color. So here we have our, uh, our A-line source. All light sources emit basically these little chunks of wave light, uh, wavelengths, and these wavelengths um, are different colors. So you can have the reds and the greens and the yellows and there's a different combination and then your eye and your brain will actually add them up and tell you oh that looks like a nice warm white light or a cool light. So the light is emitting these wavelengths. Now you have materials such as a red sweater or green carpeting that is actually going to reflect back into your eye a certain amount of wavelength. So these two are actually playing together. What happens then is your eye is measuring these different amounts of wavelengths and we have what's called rods and cones in our eyes. Our cones are actually color coded. We have three types, red, green, blue. When you add red, green, blue together you get white light. So your eye is adding up different components and in the end it's telling you I see a specific color. That's why for example that red sweater that you might be wearing will look a very different red under an incandescent lamp versus say a fluorescent lamp. So your eye is trying to take in all this data based on what kind of source that the materials are being uh, lit by. Now the current color rendering index which uh, we use, we've been using for, for many many decades is our standard color metric and what it's doing is it's basically taking these eight colors what we call R1 through R8, they're pastel colors, it's a swatch. And you would take a, a light source and say, well, how, you know, how good does that pastel pink and the greens look? And it's a weighted number. Now, if you recall, previous slide, I said your eye sees red, green, blue, which is in these rich, saturated colors, R9 through R12. Problem is, is these colors are not part of the current CRI metric. Well, guess what? LED lights emit predominantly in these rich saturated colors, not here in the pastels. So LED lighting and CRI have actually not been a good combination. And let me show you an example here. So we're taking this banner. The one on the left is under an incandescent lamp, which has a CRI of 100. That's the top of the scale, scale 0 to 100. The one on the left is under an LED, which has a lower CRI, let's say 80. But yet if I didn't tell you that and I said, you get to pick one of these and take it home today, I would bet that most of you would pick the one on the right because it looks more authentic, that white looks white, those reds are still popping, but yet under the LED system, based on the current color metric today, it's getting dinged. And that is something to be aware of. Now there is a huge movement right now of changing this antiquated color metric CRI and the Illuminating Engineering Society a couple years ago put together a task committee to say we need to fix this because solid state lighting is here and, and honestly this is going to be our light source going forward. And so what this color metric task group has done is developed a potential new color metric. As of yesterday, um, I was able to participate in listening to the Department of Energy's first webinar on this new color metric. It's called TM, Technical Memorandum 30. And TM30 is a proposed way 
to have a new color metric that will actually allow us to have a better way to visualize color under all different light sources. And so instead of those eight pastel colors, TM30 actually uses 99 different colors. It also uses gamut area, which is allowing us to understand saturation. Is this saturated heavier in the reds or the greens? It gives us a more accurate way to actually understand color metrics and, and put together specifications. Uh, this one here so that just happened yesterday will be available on the DOE's website as an archive presentation. So if you're interested to learn more about this, um, you'll be able to go to the DOE's website. We've got the link down here. And there's another one coming up on the 22nd that'll talk about basically the math and science uh, behind this new metric. So there's a big shift right now going on about really we need a, a different color metric uh, because of solid state lighting. And what I want to talk a little bit about is uh, how LEDs do this. So for example, this is um, what we call spectral power distribution, similar to the slide that I showed you with the A-line lamp. You have your blue chip, you have your yellow phosphors, and what your eye does is actually combine these two colors to say, oh, you know, I see warm white, I see cool white. Your eye sees different ways. So during the daytime, when your cones are full, full on working, you see what we call with photopic uh, vision. And at night, you see with scotopic vision. We actually see differently at night. So what we're able to start doing is taking this technology and better modify the light source to how we actually see. It's a little harder to do that with traditional technology. So you're seeing a light source that actually allows you to see a lot better, which brings us to you know, the quality of light. All right, how about delivering quality? It's our third topic. All right, the picture here. What you see on the right versus the left. We're using the exact same light fixture, and what we've done is we've changed our finishes within our room. So for example, on the left-hand side, our ceiling is less reflective than the one on the right-hand side, and same thing with the walls. Well, what's happening here is what we have something called coefficient of utilization. It's basically the efficiency of our light fixtures working with the efficiency of our room finishes. And if you see in this example, we didn't change the fixture, but we're getting 75% more light using the same amount of energy. So your finishes do matter. To explain this a little bit further, if we take, for example, here, our fluorescent, typical fluorescent fixture, if we say this is, say, a high output lumen lamp, a 3100 lumen fluorescent lamp, the minute we put it inside of a fixture, we have losses. Fixtures aren't 100% efficient, so you're going to have some lumen losses. Fluorescent is temperature sensitive. There's light loss factors. So by the time you get done, a standard fluorescent lamp may actually only be giving you close to 2,000 lumens. That's what we call relative photometry. Now when you look at an LED fixture, we're not really saying your light source and your fixture because guess what? LED fixtures, they're one and the same. They are the light source. They are the light fixture. It's one number. That's absolute photometry. Here we're talking about actual delivered lumens. Let me show you an example. Here's our, our office space. And we're going to do a one for one here. I'm going to look at a coefficient of utilization for a typical fluorescent. So my floors are about 20% reflective, my ceiling about 80. And we, uh, we calculated that this space um, is at about a 2. And our walls are about 50% reflective, which means my coefficient of utilization is about 70%. If I take that same space with an LED fixture, I'm at 90%. So what this is really saying is I don't need to do a one-for-one -one retrofit. I can actually use fewer LED fixtures to put the same amount of light in the space. So already one-for-one -one we had energy and maintenance savings, and now I need fewer of them in my space. My energy and maintenance story is even bigger. All right, the bow around this, uh, this present that we've given you, economic talk. All right, it's great. We need the numbers now. One of my prior roles to GE is I worked for a utility, and I was the lighting engineer that would sign off on the rebate checks, uh, the calculations, be able to issue those checks. And we had a very strict policy. You know, we had a certain payback number that had to be met. 
The problem is with payback, you're really only looking at the acquisition cost. You know, how much is that fixture right now? What you really need to be looking at is the rest of this, and that's life cycle costing. Because regardless of what type of fixture you put into a space, you're still going to have to pay to energize it. You're still going to have to pay to maintain it. And when you only look at a payback calculation, you don't take into consideration any maintenance savings, any maintenance impacts. You don't take into consideration these other impacts. For example, HVAC. The rule of thumb in lighting is for, depending on your location, anywhere between three to four watts of lighting savings. In a conditioned space, you'll get another one watt of savings. And with simple payback, you're not able to take advantage of that additional systemic savings that are available. Now, if you think about it, with LED systems having these extremely long lives, 10 plus years, it's, it's as though it's no longer a component in the building. It's building materials. It has lifespans now that are similar to, say, the carpeting to the paint on the walls. These are building materials now. You really do need economically to look at them in a different way to get that story. If not, you're truly penalizing uh, the discussion around this upgrade that you're looking at. Here's an example of an annualized uh, operating cost, fluorescent versus LED. So let's take a look first at the yellow box. Okay, yep, you got me. That LED fixture is more expensive than a fluorescent fixture. But again, I have to pay the utility to energize either of these fixtures. And now just looking at energy and the cost of the fixture, your fluorescent system is already more expensive. And then that sawtooth curve that I showed you earlier with, with metal halide is the same kind of story with fluorescent. I am going to have to pay for replacement lamps because they will fail. I'm going to have to pay for replacement ballasts because they're going to fail. And year after year, my fluorescent system is going to cost me more money. With HID, it's a very similar story. So the discussion here is not just about this yellow square. That's simple payback. You really do need to look at the cost of ownership of your lighting systems or life cycle costing analysis. And with that, we are at the end of the presentation. We wanted to make sure that we allowed plenty of questions because I'm sure the, uh, the question box is filling up. And uh, Dave, I will um, hand some of this back over to you. All right. First of all, Question, uh, we're going to start kind of easy here. Uh, okay. One of the first questions has to do with how do we determine what the rebates mm -hmm. are, the incentives to replace other lamps with LED lamps or LED fixtures? Uh, process question, I think I understand this one uh, to be, um, I don't know where to begin. How do I know if, say, an LED two that replaces fluorescent has a rebate in my area. Is that how you're understanding it, Dave? Yes, and I, okay. I think they're going for the utility incentive piece. Great. Okay, so there's definitely a couple pathways um, that you can do this. One is you can contact your local utility directly. Most of them have posted on their websites their rebate programs with a lot of detail that explain this. Um, if you'd like some extra help, for example, the gray bar team um, knows very intimately in their local areas, the, their, the rebate programs, and can actually guide you um, through some of that and help you with the paperwork as well. Um, that's, that's one route, um, I think, or two routes, I should say. Uh, Dave, you have any other that you want to add to that? Or to that? Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, it could be a instant utility from the rebate for certain types of lamps, like a T8 LED or a screw-in LED or it could be a percentage or an exact dollar amount based on that utility. The Gray Bar team can tell you that. Also, there is a, uh, a website, dsire.org, in addition to your local utility site, and they often have information about rebates and have that posted. So it can be a, can be a very significant part of your equation. And, you know, just to add to that, uh, make sure you are taking advantage of your local utility programs. They, they really do want you to use better technology for a lot of reasons, and they have this funding to, to really help you 
with the you know offsetting the cost. So when you start to look at just simple payback, being able to add in a utility rebate can help you with with that simple payback question, uh, and of course the lifecycle costing uh, equation as well. Okay, second question is really having to do with CRI. Um, Caitlin is asking, you know, the CRI standard aside, what about how the color feels to a person and think, you know, that perception of old blue LED versus how a warm incandescent might feel? So okay. how does good color question. feel? Okay, good question. There's actually two major color metrics that we use. CRI is one, and that's about how colors are rendered. That's that's about fidelity of colors. What uh, Caitlin is asking about is what we call color temperature. And all light sources measure this in degrees Kelvin. So for example, an incandescent lamp is typically rated at 2700, or we, we kind of we knock off the zeros, 27K, whereas say your typical office fluorescent light might be 4000K or 4K. That's about a hue or a feel. And what we're seeing trending wise is that color temperature or feel is is definitely application based but it's also subjective so a good example would be in hospitality we would see warmer temperatures because it makes us feel more like at home whereas if you go to a doctor's office you're going to see a much higher kelvin temperature um, feeling it's it's really best to make sure that you understand what the people, again, lighting's for people, what are they needing? What are they comfortable in? And be able to do that. Uh, again, you wouldn't necessarily want to be in a hotel room that has a very high blue feel. It doesn't feel like home. So that's, I think, what Caitlin's asking. And if not, Caitlin, please clarify, and we'll make sure we answer that uh, for you. Okay. Dwayne comments, very good, highly informational. And can we have future sessions discussing applications with examples? And I would assume you're going to say yes. I will most certainly say yes. I think that one of the most powerful ways to evaluate should I upgrade to LED is to know if somebody else is doing it. So case studies, um, testimonials that talk about not only the operational and sustainable impacts that making an upgrade have had, but on the people. I, I have one case study that um, is a, it's a college, it's a college arena. Um, the team was elevated to the next league, which meant they're going to be on TV, which meant their foot candle levels had to be raised, and their old metal halide system wasn't sufficient. Also, the old metal halide system was very difficult to maintain. And being able to switch to LED not only saved them energy, but it also gave them better color so that on camera they had true color, uh, you know, their school color. Um, they didn't have the buzzing from the metal halide ballasts anymore, so their sound quality was improved. I think being able to do that um, and look at case studies is, is important and, and something that we can certainly follow up with. Absolutely. So Chuck asks, if there's an environment over 90 to 100 degrees, can I use LED? That is a fantastic question. So a lot of, uh, I guess the myths of LEDs, oh, they can't take the heat. Well, yes, they can. Um, it's really about the chip itself, which is a very small but powerful part of the lighting system, being thermally managed. How do you heat sink it? What kind of materials are you using? And we um, have seen systems that are being used in spaces that are pushing 65 degrees Celsius, which is almost 100 and about 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so you really can use LEDs in pretty warm, um, pretty warm environments. They actually can take it. That's a good question, Chuck. Thanks. Yep. And Roshan asked the question, do you, could you touch on lumen depreciation of fluorescent NHID and then how that compares to LED lumen depreciation. I know you touched on that earlier. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, a, that's another really good question. I think understanding what's going on with your lumens, because that's really what this gets down to. Lumen depreciation for fluorescent, if you talk about T12s, 
because I know some of you still have them, it's about 65%. So from the point that you take that fluorescent lamp out of the box until it fails, you've lost a significant portion of your light output. So it has a pretty dismal curve. Metal halide, standard metal halide is about the same. Today's uh, better T8 fluorescent systems are right around 95%. So they hold on to their lumens pretty well, but they still fail. They still are part of the statistical B50 failure mode. With LEDs now, you're looking at a light source that 50,000, 100,000 hours has depreciated very little compared to a traditional source. And um, there's a few tools out there, uh, for example, GE Lighting does have one, where you can actually put these different sources next to each other on a graph and you can see visually that it's pretty stunning. The lumen depreciation of an LED versus that of traditional sources is, uh, is pretty small. Great question. Okay. One of the questions that's popping up several times, there's a number of folks asking questions around, it has to do with the power source and uh, the driver and the relationship of that to the life of the LED fixture. Ah, I love this question. Um, the life of a driver, if you want to talk about um, failure mode in an LED fixture, probably more than likely the first component that will fail, actually just stop working, will be your driver. The driver is very similar in functionality to a ballast that you would see on a fluorescent or HID system. Now that being said, your LED drivers have a typical life, you know, really depends on your burn hours, but a typical life of close to 15 years. And when you're looking at an LED fixture, that say is 50,000 hours in a commercial building that has a life of you know 10 years your driver is going to last pretty much the same as your light source however that is a very good question to always ask when you are evaluating an LED fixture uh, because some manufacturers may not have the same ratings so it's a good question to ask in your analysis okay then there's a number of questions that also go around retrofits. So for the majority of the questions that are here, the user has an existing fixture. In most cases, it was metal halide. Mm -hmm. And question number one comes around, can I retrofit a LED driver into that fixture and, and do that correctly? So it's a replacement lamp or maybe a, a retrofit into that. And then the second question that's along those lines really has to do with can I use one LED fixture to replace multiples? Okay, let me take the first part of the question. LED replacements come in a lot of different flavors. You can have everything from a simple lamp change out that will rely on your existing fluorescent or HID ballast. So it's very easy change. It's a matter of just screwing out the old lamp and screwing in a new lamp, and it'll operate uh, without all, you know having to rewire your fixtures and worry about your UL listing on your fixtures. I would like to make sure I caution everybody on the line here that when you start to mess around with parts and pieces in your fixtures, it's possible that you could um, take away the UL listing of your fixture and that could cause some liability issues. So again, that's my caution. Um, lamps that are rated for these type of replacements, you'll want to make sure you look for that. So it's very, that's the easy button. Problem is, is do you know how old your ballast is, your fluorescent or HID ballast? If you know how old it is, and say you did a major retrofit a year, two years, three years ago, you know, the life of that ballast is between 10 to 15 years, you're probably okay. If you don't know the life of that ballast um, and that ballast goes out, you're going to have to replace the ballast for your LED to work. So there's some cost uh, risk there. The next flavor would be a kit. So you can use the existing fixture housing um, and use a kit that will go right up into it. And again, your UL listing will be fine if the product is rated for that. And that'll give you a more bang for your buck. It'll be a lot better light quality. We're not worrying about some existing equipment. 
to the next flavor which is a you know completely new fixture when you start to get into that realm you actually can use fewer of them if you have the flexibility so this is where understanding coefficient utilization and how light is being delivered is really important and I know the gray bar GE team can actually help with lighting layouts to make sure that your lights been optimized and you're not um, changing your foot candle levels to something that isn't recommended um, second part of the question I'm gonna have to ask you to repeat it Dave I want to sure. make sure and, and Jack it. actually kind of capsulized it really well hey, if you're gonna use fewer fixtures how do you maintain lighting uniformity ah yes okay so fewer lighting fixtures now if you think about it you have a four foot T8 lamp or you have a large metal halide lamp um, and you've got these spaced out and now you're relying on a rather large light source when you look at an LED fixture a luminaire you have several small point sources and these point sources um, can either be aimed a different direction so that you're actually throwing light out into different pockets of the space and light is additive so we can actually create better uniformity not just horizontally but also vertically and this is where LEDs do excel especially in outdoor lighting um, they excel in providing much higher uniformity ratios for example a typical LED outdoor is about a maximum ratio of 1 to 2 whereas HID if you're lucky is about a 1 to 5 most of the time it's significantly higher than that so the, the question about, you know, how do I maintain my uniformity, it's actually much, much easier to do with an LED system, whether you're doing one for one or you're doing a fixture reduction. Okay, thank you. And uh, just for the folks who are asking the question, uh, will this presentation be posted? Uh, the answer is yes. We'll have it not only on the facility executive website, we'll have it on Graybar dot com power smart and GE lighting site as well um, next questions really two of them have to do with dollars so first of all what was the kilowatt hour rate assumed in the payback charts okay we when we do these uh, generic examples we assume the national average of approximately 10 cents a kilowatt hour um, obviously everybody has a different rate across the country I you know talk to some people are as low as four cents and some people as high as 28 cents so you really do have to throw in the calculation there it will change your number that's a good point to to do uh, but we do use the national average when we do these examples so about 10 cents yeah. and as a point if the gray bar team comes out does an assessment and a proposal we'll connect with you to get your exact rate from your utility so that it's absolutely correct when uh, when you're looking at the final ROIs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, next one has to do. Uh, David asks for the life cycle cost analysis example. There was an air conditioning component that suggested the LED technology reduced AC loads. But what about the LED drivers? Do they emit a comparable amount of heat compared to the old valve technologies? So I look at these kind of questions this way um, one watt whether it's an LED system a fluorescent a hot dog or your tennis shoe one watt is going to be the same BTU so let's start there um, would you start to have systems that use overall lower wattages you have lower BTUs which means your air conditioning is not having to cool that that component down so that's really the first thing to look at um, to specifically address the question when you look at a system for example a 400 watt metal halide don't forget about the 60 watts that the ballast consumes so now I have a 460 watt system when you look at spec sheets for LED fixtures that one number just like the lumen number the system wattage number includes the driver as well so when you're doing that analysis uh, I, I really think that with solid state lighting, with LED lighting, you're getting a more accurate number and, and less chance to forget about um, something that that's, could cause loads in the system. So your spec sheets will include all that information. Uh, hopefully that answered the question. If not, um, if the, the caller could let us know. Okay. 
So Randy asked a question that really cuts to the heart of the whole thing and, and maybe the best question yet of uh, given LEDs and the technologies. And, you know, I know all LEDs probably aren't created equal. How yeah. do I tell what the lifespan might be on a given lamp? Good question, Randy. You're right. They, Randy gets the prize. Good question. Um, this is a, it's been a slippery slope in the industry. Um, to be honest, there currently does not exist a system life rating for LED systems. What exists is a life rating for the light source or the chips. And I'm sure there is no one on this phone who's only going to use chips. We're all going to use systems. This is where manufacturers really do have to, uh, to use an honor code of making sure that the information that they're giving you is accurate. Because a company can can rely on the life rating that a chip manufacturer gave them. Then they're going to take that chip, they're going to stick it in a fixture or in a replacement lamp, and there are deratings that can happen or will happen because you have to thermally manage, you have optical ratings, you have a lot of things that go on. But the, the loophole right now is there doesn't exist. Now the IES, just like the color metric committee, they do have a committee that is putting together a life system uh, rating that should be out I'm hoping by early next year that's what the buzz is and this will take a look at things like driver failures um, yellowing of any lenses other potential failure modes that can happen in a system and that will hopefully take away some of this wild wild west that we still have have with this so how do you know you have to ask, you have to analyze. Um, I can give you one piece of advice is that you can ask a manufacturer for something called an LM79, Lumen Maintenance LM79 report. And this is not a pass-fail report, it's just information, but it's information that will tell you how that product is performing, what the test results have come back, and it'll give you the knowledge that you need. I know that a lot of um, utility rebate programs are actually asking for LM79 reports to make sure that, that the products are quality. Uh, so that is, is probably one tool that you could add to your toolbox to, to help you evaluate, is this product really performing like they say it is? Okay, then to the product performance, we're going to stay on that theme. How does the count of starts on an LED affect the life? Does it lessen the life as it does with fluorescent lamps? Oh, that's a nice question. I think um, to understand a little bit more, let's take a step back and talk about fluorescent first. So fluorescent lamps have um, what they have, a ca they call the cathode at each end of the lamp. It looks like a little filament. And on that, that coil, is an emissive coating and every time you turn on that fluorescent lamp a little bit of that coating splutters off and when your fluorescent lamp stops working the failure mode is there's no more coating on that lamp it's needed to help with the chemical reactions within the lamp so it will fail well if you turn your lamps on and off on and off all day long for example maybe you have them on an ox sensor that hasn't been commissioned right if you turn your fluorescent lamps on and off five or more times a day, you start to reduce the life. With LEDs, they don't really care. You can cycle them on and off rapidly all day long. It doesn't have that impact. So they can, they can actually take it. They're more durable when it comes to some. Okay, good. So then Nicholas, well, and a handful of other folks are asking questions about warranty. So seeing warranties all over the board, how do you read and interpret what is a good warranty and what does it really mean if it's a 10-year <laughs> warranty, let's say. All right. Um, I would say definitely read the fine print and one of the parts of the warranty would be does it include the whole system? There are a lot of companies out there um, that are using similar loopholes that may say if in a small print that their warranty only covers the board that has the chips on it. And again, you, you don't use chips, you use an entire light fixture or a lamp. So you want to make sure, one, that the warranty is a true system warranty. So that's the key word, is look for system warranties. Um, the warranty length of time, I would also base that on the company itself. Uh, a lot of new entrants to market, um, not quite established, that might offer a long warranty 
you know, are they going to be there in 10 years? So again, going with a reputable company, and there's a lot of them out there, um, going with these companies that have been around a while, you know they're going to be here when those, those warranties are happening. Now, just let me add a caveat to warranties. Warranties, whether it's lighting or the refrigerator that you have at home or your TV, are really based on infant mortality, uh, which means is there a manufacturing defect that's going to happen very quickly. That's why a warranty doesn't necessarily match the actual life rating of a system. For example, you may have a 10-year-old refrigerator at home, but when you bought that refrigerator, you got a one-year warranty. And why? That's to cover any manufacturing defects uh, or component defects that might hap have happened. Um, it's, it's not going to be the life of the system. Anything you want to add on that one? I know, Dave, you get involved with warranties quite a bit. Well, you know, my, my easy answer is always I, I don't have a whole lot of faith in a 10-year warranty from a company that's been in business for three years. And having said that, we, you know, we really drum home the message that uh, Gray Bar and GE have been doing this for well over 125 years. We're very careful with, uh, with the technologies and how we represent. But we are seeing a very wide variety of warranties out there and some we're taking with a, a little bit more of a grain of salt than others. So uh, completely agree with you uh, regarding systems and, and reading that fine print. Mm -hmm. So key is buying from a company who you can, uh, can really rely on. Exactly. The um, next couple of questions, um, Tom has one, uh, Jerry has one. They're, they're basically around application and um, it, it kind of all goes into the, to a design factor, I think, for you, Shelly. Uh, okay. What would you use in a gym? What would you use in a classroom? What would you use in performing arts? What would you use in um, a computer science lab? So how do you determine color temperature and what fixture is appropriate for what application? I am definitely an application focused person. Um, spent uh, 15 plus years of my career in, in specification. I, so I, I love those kinds of questions. Unfortunately, it's case by case. So um, to be very general, um, let me try and summarize it. I would say that first you, need, you definitely need to understand what task is being performed in the space. And a lot of manufacturers, and GE being one of them, have task specific type of fixtures. For example, there's a fixture that's very specific for office spaces. There's a fixture that's very specific for manufacturing facility that needs hose down capability and high temperature. So um, you, can, you can definitely ask the question of, of the, the Gray Bar GE team to say, this is my application and I need help. And we can make sure that we steer you to, to the right direction. For example, on our website, we have it by industry. Um, so if you are an industrial customer and you're scratching your head saying, I really don't know what to use, you can actually go to that part of the website that speaks your language. Um, so it's, it's hard to just give one generic statement, but there are fixtures and lamps that are very specific to tasks. Okay, understood. And uh, Michael asks, how much UV light is typically emitted by LEDs? Okay, the spectral power distribution chart that I showed earlier, which showed a blue spike and then kind of a yellow red spike, you'll, if you were noticing at either end, you know, one side's UV, one side's IR, that's where LEDs drop off. It is negligible, and it's negligible to the point where I wouldn't say it's exactly zero, there's point zero zero and a bunch of numbers after that, um, but it is negligible to the point where world-class museums are using LED lighting now to light their masterpieces and it's causing, uh, there's less damage that occurs because of that lack of UV um, and IR as well. So if you have an application that, that you're sensitive to this, LED lighting is actually a better solution than traditional sources. Okay. And then thinking end of life, what is the proper disposal procedure for LEDs compared to the mercury content in fluorescence? Okay. Right now, we're at kind of the infant stage of how do we do this. So some of the systems that are out there 
are, inst are instead of being a fully integrated fixture where in that LED reaches end of life, you have to remove the entire fixture and dispose of it some, some way, you actually can take out maybe just the light engine or just the driver and the bulk of the fixture, the housing, which is also generally the heat sinking, uh, can re remain in place. So a majority of, uh, percentage-wise, of LED fixtures are recyclable material. Uh, but again, the industry is in its uh, infancy of how do we dispose of this. And uh, I was just actually talking to a lamp recycling plant here a couple months back where they're actually shifting their operations away from um, how do you recycle just fluorescent lamps and ballast to how do we start to recycle now um, LED systems. So it is uh, something that's occurring right now in our industry. Okay. Jim asked an interesting question. He said, what about LED uh, excuse me, what about LED failures? It is hard to believe that none fail. What's a, what's a range on the failure rates? LEDs themselves, if they are, say, overdriven, uh, their milliamp rating is beyond what they were actually tested for, uh, could fail. You can also cause an LED to fail if, say, the soldering uh, portion on the board was not done properly, so that would be a manufacturing thing, could cause some failure. Heat can definitely cause them to fail. So yes, you're correct, an LED, um, it's not going to glow forever, there is the potential for it to to fail. However, if it's been designed properly within the system, um, it will last an extremely long time. Uh, failure rates are very, very small. I, we're you know, each company is different, but we're we're less than I think half a percent. Um, and we've been doing this since the 90s with traffic signals and rail signals and signage uh, is included as an LED type of product. So it's very, very small number, which is impressive. Very impressive. Okay, then a couple of questions are leading towards uh, this whole wonderful world of controls. One uh, has to do with what are the differences in the driver between dimming and non-dimming, and the second is um, what about the programmable, um, excuse me, programmable color or CRI of LEDs? What do you see out there for that? I think as far as controls, uh, yes, you do have to specify a driver that is a dimmable driver, just like you would for, say, a fluorescent ballast. You do need a dimmable driver. And you also need to know what's your protocol. Are you 0 to 10? Are you dolly? Um, are you going to be wireless? So there are uh, control signals, separate control signals that are going to come in and talk to this dimmable driver. So you, you do need to have a little bit more information up front about, about how you're going to control your systems and how you're going to talk to them. Um, as far as color changing or tunability, that's a relatively new technology in the white, being able to change, say, one light source, one lamp um, from a 3K up to a 5K and the back down to the 4K. Uh, but, you know, the technology does exist out there, and again, that is another driver, but it's also a different series of chips. So there are multiple channels that have to be controlled within that light fixture. Okay, and then uh, there's a couple of questions that are really getting to very specific um, answers, and I'm wondering if we might be able to just take those offline and uh, correspond via email. Uh, rather than uh, do it on the phone today. So um, at that point, uh, Shelly and Ann, I, I think we're basically done with our questions and always uh, we've got our two email addresses on the screen as well for future questions. And we will look through the, um, a couple of the questions that had uh, very specific answers to them and be back to you via email. Yep, I agree. Yeah. And again, thanks everybody. Thank, Thank you, you. Shelley. Thank Thank you, Dave and Shelley. This is Ann Cosgrove, the editor again. Uh, thank you both for your for your presentation and Dave for facilitating. Uh, it was a, really a, a lively, informative session. Thanks to all our attendees, and as David mentioned, any questions we did not get to uh, can be addressed offline. Uh, additionally, uh, the presentation will be available 
on the facility executive website, uh, as well as the GE Lighting or the graybar.com PowerSmart websites, you'll receive an email with details on that. So thanks for joining us, and have a great day.